What's up everybody, Matt Moran here for another car review. This is the 2022 Hyundai Ionic 5. So about the all new Ionic here. So this is a brand new car. It has nothing to do with the old Ionic that Hyundai used to sell. And this is the first Hyundai vehicle on their brand new eGMP electric car platform. So it's a very interesting platform and it gives this vehicle very interesting proportions. And as a result, you have a wheelbase here that is longer than a Hyundai Palisade. They're massive three row crossover, yet it's in this vehicle that looks like it's about the size of a Volkswagen Golf. But the pictures and the videos are kind of deceiving. This is actually actually a good bit bigger than something like a GTI or some other smaller hatchback. It's a little bit on the larger side actually. It's just very, very interesting in that regard, but also as far as the styling of it. I think this is one of the coolest looking cars of 2022 easily up front there. I mean, it kind of looks almost to me like a modern interpretation of what like a DeLorean would look like with those headlights with the squared off kind of look to them. It's just so, so cool the way they even did the little, little tiny like matrix LEDs there within the LED rings that you have. And, uh, you know, otherwise just all blocked off in the front there, of course, you don't need any kind of cooling since there is no engine under the hood here. And it's just a very cool look up front. But all the interesting little details you see continue on uh, to the rest of the vehicle as well. So coming down to the sides, you'll see this like shutter-like appearance here to these little fender flares you have and you have these massive 20 inch wheels here on this limited trim they're also pretty wide tires here too which we'll talk about more once we hit a back road but so that's all interesting you also have all these other little interesting little cuts and lines in the uh, lower part of the doors going out back i think it looks just as cool as the front you know you have more of those little matrix led taillights there and uh you know just all those other little details like you even have this like rear spoiler that looks like it's taken off of veloster N or something with just how sporty that looks and uh, yet you know you still have you know all those other little cuts and interesting little details there in the lower part of the rear bumper and um, I just think from every single angle this thing is really well thought out with the way they designed it as well they didn't just make it cool for the sake of looking cool they really blended everything in nicely like for example you have the charging port right there by the one taillight but it's nicely integrated it doesn't stand out like a sore thumb like it does on a lot of other electric cars and so the team that designed this vehicle I got to give them a round of applause because this thing is just so cool looking and really stands out on the road. All right, so let's turn it on and go for a drive. The Ionic still has uh, the normal Hyundai key, actually. I'm kind of surprised. I thought maybe they'd do something a little bit more unique. But it's a good key and does have all the buttons there on the back to um, actually do the self-parking thing. So it'll go forwards and backwards with the key and do other limited things like that. But anyway, just a really nice key. Not too thick or anything either. And uh, feels fairly premium. And uh, so, yeah, but it is, of course, keyless access, keyless entry, and push button start. It actually will auto-present the door handles to you whenever you walk up to it. So anyway, you just leave the key in your pocket, hit the uh, EV start stop button, and it turns right on. And if you're curious to hear about the interior in the Ionic 5, my wife and I actually just did a full in-depth interior review on this vehicle, so I'll link that above. You can go watch that if you want to hear all our thoughts on this interior. Overall, it's very interesting. Obviously, as you can see, it's very different from any other Hyundai and really different than a lot of other vehicles in general these days. And so this interior design definitely has some pros and cons to it. So you definitely want to go watch that video to hear all the uh, positives and the negatives here of the Ionic 5 interior. All right, so setting off here in the Ionic 5. So the first thing that I've noticed, there's a lot to take in here because uh, it's so much different than even some other electric cars that I reviewed. So first thing, you do have a nice high seating position. It's a lot higher than, again, a normal hatchback or something, which is deceptive because this feels like it's just this like oversized, enormous hatchback. But you do feel like you're sitting up a good bit higher and it kind of almost has that like, crossover type uh, seating position with just how high up you are. Other things you'll note here, well, of course, it's very smooth, very quiet, being all electric and, you know, very immediate with the power and stuff. I do love the little sounds that it makes, you know, under like 25 miles per hour and whenever you're backing up and stuff to alert people around you that you're, you know, driving. And so whenever you're rolling around at low speeds, it all feels very futuristic. Another thing that really stood out at me immediately is it has this enormous augmented head-up display. It's honestly, I think, probably the largest head-up display I've ever used and I think it's definitely one of the biggest ones out there, if not the biggest. And so 
it's very, very cool with what it can, you know, kind of project onto the road there as far as navigation instructions. But typically when you're not running nav, all you're going to be seeing is the speed, the speed limit, and then also any kind of safety stuff for blast spot monitoring and, uh, you know, lane keep, all that kind of stuff. But yeah, and so right now I have it in the level one regen mode. So you have three levels of regen and then there's eye pedal mode, which is a one pedal driving type of thing where, um, you know, it will come to a full stop just by taking your foot off of the gas pedal. And uh, so it's nice depending on, you know, what you want to do. You also do have paddle shifters here to change the regen on the fly, which is a really nice thing because that's something that a lot of other electric vehicles don't have. I really loved it actually in the Kia Niro EV I reviewed a couple years ago, but stuff like the Mustang Mach-E and the Volkswagen ID4 don't have those and so if you're an average you know sh uh, shopper that just you know wants a normal driving experience you don't want to mess with that stuff you'll probably be relieved that there's no paddle shifters in the competitors but as an enthusiast I really like these paddle shifters because it means when you're going down a long grade going downhill and things like that you can play around with that and get the maximum amount of regeneration and then back off of that regen whenever you want to start coasting again and uh, so you know it's just kind of cool you have that customization if you want it visibility is also very good very good view forward nice than eight pillars view out of the sides and view out of the back is all really good but I'm gonna go ahead and put it up into the sport mode here and let's turn down onto this back road and see how it does and here we go <laughs> wow I kicked in fast wow okay whoo that is quick that feels faster than the numbers suggest so um, this is the dual motor all-wheel drive version of the Ionic 5 here. And so uh, this one does 320 horsepower, 446 pound-feet of torque. So they're only claiming a 4.9 seconds 0 to 60 time, but I don't know. By the seat of my pants, that felt closer to like a mid to low four second time in my opinion. That was uh, very, very punchy. Um, <laughs> I am impressed. Wow, and yeah, sport mode really doesn't waste any time. I mean, you tip into that gas there and it really takes off. And I don't know if you can hear, but there's this very quiet little electric motor like whirring sound that you uh, hear and uh, man, whoo, this thing <laughs> is quick. I've driven plenty of electric cars already, so it's not just the instant power. But this feels faster than those numbers suggest. This actually does feel, I think, a tiny bit faster than the Mustang Mach-E in its premium all-wheel drive version, even though that has a very similar, I think it's a 5.2 seconds or to 60. So it is slightly slower by the numbers. The Mach-E, by the way, does have very similar torque figures, but it does have a decent bit less horsepower, unless you go up to the GT versions, that is. But yeah, very, very impressive. Now, this is um, the uh, top version of the Ionic 5. So that means that it has 256 miles of range from a 77 kilowatt hour battery and that's the gross rating they haven't said what the actual usable rating is so you know but it's probably somewhere around 70 uh you know kilowatt hours or so now you can get a smaller battery version that's coming a little bit later just a few months down the road um and uh that one also does way less horsepower it's like 168 horsepower or something but the other uh like rear wheel drive versions that do still run this larger battery those will do 303 miles of range but you do give up 100 horsepower or so and about 200 pound feet of torque so they're not quite as quick. Anyway, we're cutting up some corners here and let's see how the Ionic 5 handles them. Wow, very flat neutral handling. I mean, electric cars usually have pretty flat handling, but this feels much more eager than I was expecting. Uh, steering also feels pretty, pretty responsive. It might be a tiny bit slower than a Mach-E, just uh, from my memory of the Mach-E, but this, Wow, this really handles good. And one thing this definitely does have over the Mach-E is grip. So this thing is running these 20 inch wheels, but they're 255 wide Michelin Primacy all season tires. So these tires being 255 wide, that is a huge distinction because like the Mach-E only runs like 225 wide tires. And I did notice that the Mach-E, in addition to being several hundred pounds heavier, had those skinnier tires. And so front end grip definitely wasn't the best and it definitely didn't handle um, as confidently as this does. Now the Mach-E had a little more tail happiness to it, kind of gave it, I think what they're trying to do is more of a Mustang type vibe with that uh, Mach-E, but this, it just grips and goes, and good grief, this thing is, you could really tear up a back road in this thing, like full out of salt, and even though this thing weighs over 4,600 pounds, uh, you wouldn't really notice it because man, oh man, this thing, it is really a good handler. I am 
blown away. I, I mean, I was expecting it to be a little bit better than the Mach-E just based on the tires, but this is a good bit better. And, oh man, this thing is <laughs> fun to throw around corners. And it does not feel 4,600 pounds either. It feels, I would say that it actually feels, you know, around 4,000 pounds to me, just again, seat of the pants kind of feeling just by the way they disguise the weight. I think part of that also goes down to this longer wheelbase. And so that's gonna really give you this very stable planted ride. It also gives you a really smooth ride. And even on these 20 inch wheels, which don't have much sidewall on them, it is really doing a good job of soaking up bumps and just feels very uh, comfortable, honestly. I haven't had any complaints with uh, ride and stuff. We'll go over some potholes here in a few minutes, but um, just as it is, it's just really a nice thing to just roll around and it feels like you're just like gliding over the pavement, uh, but yet you have this incredible grip. It's really a wonderful best of both worlds scenario. But even if we want to play around with the other drive modes, so there's eco mode, and that will really dull throttle response. Um, so if you're someone who doesn't want to feel like this thing's like trying to take off on you at every possible second, eco mode, you know, obviously will give you the best range and stuff as well. Um, it also does uh, chill out the climate control so it won't heat up or cool down the cabin quite as fast. Um, but, you know, so that's fine if you want a more relaxed feeling. Normal mode is definitely the happy medium, though, where, you know, it doesn't feel like the throttle is totally dead, um, but yet, you know, you still, it's not quite as jumpy as, as sport mode is. Um, and so that also will change the steering weight a little bit. But I'm going to do another acceleration in sport mode here because it's just too much fun. And I'm going to actually really slow down here. We'll do it from a stop. And here we go. Oh man, yeah, it's good. <laughs> and thankfully you still have some pretty good brakes here to haul you down because this thing will really get up to speed very quickly. But I also love how it really squats down. You feel the suspension moving around whenever you are accelerating hard. That nose lifts up and uh, you don't, don't have too much brake dive though. It's mostly just under acceleration, which I love. That gives you some drama. So this doesn't feel totally clinical and cold, even though you're not having a screaming engine behind you or anything. You know, just the fact that you're just getting that nose lifting up and the G's, it's fun. It is fun. It's a different type of fun, I will admit, but this is still so much fun to drive um, and it's the power and stuff is so much fun to use. But yeah, brakes do feel really good. So, you know, the friction brakes, if you don't want to be using the eye pedal all the time, they do feel nice and normal, thankfully. So it's not like any kind of weird sensations in the brake pedal. It feels very e easy to use. It's not too grabby or anything. So, you know, using the brakes is going to be very user friendly if you're coming out of a normal gas powered vehicle. But yeah, and also the all-wheel drive system is worth noting. I mean, I wasn't expecting it to have any issues, but it does a really good job of putting the power to the ground here. I also really love the gauge cluster here, especially whenever you change it into sport mode. Now it has this like power meter that will also show you when you're regenerating and stuff, but it's a really cool animation for how it does it. But it just, it means that whenever you floor it, you just see this like red, just bar graph, just like shooting towards the front of the vehicle. And it's just a, a little, just fun extra little thing. These are the things that I hope, you know, while yes, we will be losing the sound of you know these uh, vehicles with having everything be electric but I hope that they start playing up some of those things even though they seem gimmicky to some people I think adding in the toys and the fun stuff wow okay so it actually kind of gave me a little bit of a step out there from the back end gave me a little bit of a rear bias kind of feeling there coming out of that corner so if you do power out of a corner this thing will play with you it is not just glued to the road I mean it still is very very stable but it likes to play I like like that that's good and we're coming up some other corners here Let's see how it does in these tighter corners as my camera gear goes flying very confident handling yes handling is hands down better than a regular Mach-E for sure I still have not driven a Mach-E GT so I can't say how it compares to that which does have wider tires thankfully but this is a lot cheaper than the uh, Mach-E GT so if you want better handling out of an EV and you don't want to be spending over 60 grand here you go Ionic 5 is the answer I think and by the way I've been primarily comparing this with the uh, Mach-E because that's I think the best competitor ID4 definitely doesn't handle as fun as this does and you know just doesn't feel nearly as exciting as this does this has more power as well the wider tires everything else id4 is kind of a distant third as far as the ranking of these three uh evs but 
Anyway, so yeah, very, very impressive on a back road, very impressive performance. Another thing as far as performance goes that's very impressive for an electric vehicle is the battery pack here in this thing. So this thing runs, uh, like I mentioned, you know, the battery pack is, you know, a good size, you have a good amount of range, but not only that, but the way that this thing recharges is amazing because it has an 800 volt electrical system here. And so that means that this battery pack can charge much faster than what you get with like the Mach-E or, uh, you know, any other electric vehicle outside of the Tiger and the e-tron GT and the new lucid which is like 150 grand um, this does that same fast 350 kilowatt hour fast charging which means that um, basically the charging time is way better than like the Mach-E and the ID4 so this thing will do a 10% to 80% charge if you can find one of those chargers which right now in the beginning of 2022 is tough to find but if you can find one of those super fast chargers this thing will do a 10% to 80% charge in just 18 minutes and compare that to like the Mach-E, doing that same recharge takes 45 minutes on a Mach-E. Um, so, I mean, you're talking about, you know, less than half the amount of time. I mean, you are, it's way, way shorter. And so if you're road tripping, um, you know, I mean, obviously you can still plan your meals and your stops around those longer recharge times and stuff like the Mach-E, and it's not as much of an inconvenience as a lot of people may think it is. But with this, there's really a very minor inconvenience. If you have those chargers, 18 minutes, I mean, that's basically a bathroom break, buying a snack and coming back and you know, you're basically at least halfway through that charge by that point, if not more. And so, you know, I mean, this is very impressive. And I think this is gonna really help, you know, those who wanna do road trips. And if you are someone who does do a lot of long distance driving in your EV, hands down, I mean, that recharge time alone is probably enough to sell you on this over a Mach-E and all the other competitors out there outside of, you know, maybe a Tesla, which also can do some pretty fast charging, but it still isn't as fast as, you know, this and the Taycan and, you know, all those other super expensive uh, EVs. So very impressive from that standpoint as well. That power never gets old. And it's also really nice just for passing people. You know, that's the great thing of electric vehicles. You have instant power, so you get an immediate pass. You don't have to wait for any kind of downshifting or anything. You know, it's just a one-speed transmission, and it just goes, and that's it. And, uh, oh, man, yeah, this thing is a blast. And now I'm out on the highway here in the Ionic 5, and uh, it's actually, so even on this little bit of a noisier part of the highway here, still pretty quiet and refined in here it feels really nice and uh yeah now we're on a quieter part and it's very impressive with the quietness partially because it's electric but also partially just because of the way they've done a pretty good job here with the refinement in my opinion and uh other things here so i'm you know using the highway drive assist uh, system that uh, this is like the newest 2.0 version that hyundai has and so we'll do you know the steering assist for you it still is a hands-on system which is notable because in the Mach-E you can now have the hands-free blue cruise system um, no hands-free system here in the ionic no plans to offer one by the way either from hyundai anytime soon so if you want hands-free cruising Mach-E is going to be the way to go this system will also do automated lane changes which is one area where it's uh, you know a little bit more advanced than the average um, you know lane keeping assist system but otherwise this system has worked pretty well so far. That's something I will continue to test in my week with the Ionic 5 here because past highway drive assist systems and past Hyundais have let me down and haven't been the best with tracking the road lines. But this system so far is doing a pretty good job. It isn't quite as nervous as it has been in other Hyundais in the past. But of course, as far as the other stuff with the adaptive cruise, it does a very good job with inching up and all those types of things. But just keeping the lanes here, like this is a little bit trickier here with the way it's paved and stuff. It's doing a good job going around this corner nice and smoothly and uh, does a really good job here. Hopefully it's a little bit better here in the Ionic, but it's a really nice cruiser here out on the highway otherwise. And uh, so yeah, that's about all of my first impressions here in the Ionic 5. But thanks to Hyundai, I'm gonna have the Ionic 5 here for an entire week. So I'm gonna drive around all over the place. I'm gonna be recharging it in my garage and you know seeing what it's like to live with, uh, how it does efficiency wise, all that kind of stuff. Then I'll come back and give you guys my final real world efficiency number here as well as my thoughts on the pricing its competition and anything else I noticed here during my week with it. 
All right, so I've been driving the Ionic 5 here for a week now, and uh, I've really enjoyed my time in it. It's actually better than I was expecting it to be, and uh, it's just a lot of fun to drive, and I've just, I felt pretty at home in it, too. It was just a very comfy thing to just cruise around in. But it wasn't all good stuff here with the Ionic. The more that I live with it, the more that a few of its shortcomings did become apparent to me. So, first off, you know, I've been continuing to monitor the adaptive cruise control system. I was continuing to test out the lane keep assist um, you know, function to see if the highway drive assist works better here in this vehicle than it has in past Hyundais and Kias. And it's better. It isn't crossing over the lanes anymore, at least with the, at least with the testing I was doing here this week. It didn't do that. But it still was a very nervous lane keep system where it's constantly twitching the wheel and doing like very micro ping-ponging. And some of the best systems, you know, they'll maybe make some kind of correction, but they'll be broader strokes, if that makes sense, as far as how it makes those corrections. So this is hyperactive with making those corrections, which is good, but it just makes it feel a little twitchy. And I actually felt like if you're someone who easily gets car sick, the steering jerking motions were so much so that I think it could actually make someone car sick on a road trip. So still don't love the adaptive cruise system here in this. Again, the normal like slowing down for traffic and stuff works fine. It's just the lane keep part that isn't as good. And I mean, obviously if you want the best lane keep assist system out there, you're gonna wanna go for the Mach-E because that has the blue cruise system, which is truly hands-free. And in the hands-free systems that I used in other vehicles like Cadillac Super Cruise, the difference between having your hands up here and having it assist you and having your hands on your lap, just resting and paying attention um, is really a night and day difference as far as relaxation. So if you're worried about that stuff, I'd go for the Mach-E currently or, you know, some of the other stuff like Cadillac. We'll have the Lyric coming out here. But in the meantime, um, yeah, just that's the only thing I didn't love about that system. Uh, the other thing that I discovered that I didn't enjoy is the fact there's no rear wiper in the Ionic 5, which I honestly didn't pay attention to immediately. But then we got some rainy days and on those rainy days, that window did actually accumulate a good amount of water on it and kind of block my vision a little bit. So they said that they did that just so that you could have the best possible aerodynamics, which is fine, but other EVs still do have rear wipers so how much did they gain by ditching the rear wiper versus how much of a pain is it going to be to not have a rear wiper i feel like that uh you know benefit uh probably doesn't uh, outweigh you know the inconvenience of not having a wiper so not in love with that decision and then another thing that also is a little bit unexpected was how slow this charges whenever you aren't on the fast chargers so at my house i don't have any kind of 240 volt outlet in my garage i don't have any kind of fast charging setup I just use a normal wall outlet and just do the super slow charging because I mean over the course of a week here I drove 104 miles that's not hard to keep up with usually um, even with the slowest chargers with the other EVs that I've uh, reviewed for a week and so I was expecting to not have an issue you know I just plug it in every night and uh, you know charge it while I'm on the off-peak electricity hours for my grid and not have an issue but it was I found it was kind of hard to keep up with uh, my driving and keep up with the charge here in the Ionic because it seemed to charge abnormally slow on A120. I mean, obviously, again, it will be slow. And if you want faster charging, you know, get a, a charger installed in your house. But um, I was showing around, it was showing me at least it was doing like 0.6 kilowatt hours to 0.7 kilowatt hours for the average charge. And that seems pretty slow because, I mean, it was feeling like I was getting like a mile per hour of charge or something. It was incredibly slow. And and, um, you know, for example, in the Mach-E, I was able to get about three miles of charge per hour on that same slow outlet. So that made it a lot easier to keep up with, um, you know, because if I did, you know, just a quick run to the grocery store or something, you know, you kill five, 10 miles, you get that back easily and then some, you know, over a night of charging. And so it's not a big deal, but with this, it just seems strangely slow. Obviously I could have gone and topped off an Electrify America station and, you know, gotten back to an you know, 80% charge in a matter of you know a handful of minutes but just one little thing to note there if you are in one of those niche scenarios but otherwise uh, I really enjoyed my time here it was flawless by the way there were no issues and then so really the last things to mention here are my actual efficiency and the pricing and how it compares with competitors so as far as efficiency as far as driving around uh, electrical efficiency here I've been averaging 2.2 miles per kilowatt hour and that is a little bit on the low side now I was driving this vehicle primarily in sub uh, 32 degree temperatures here so all freezing temps and uh, currently by the way you know we're sitting at you know like 20 degrees here outside so 
pretty cold and obviously electric vehicles and their range and all that and their efficiency isn't as good in the winter time. So your mileage may vary. And in the Mach-E, for example, that I had, which had an even bigger battery and also had all wheel drive still, I was getting about 3.1 miles per kilowatt hour. And that actually, I was doing that test in very early spring. Um, so it was a little warmer than this for sure, but it wasn't, you know, like ideal testing temperatures for that car either. And uh, like I said, your mileage may vary, but I will just say that that is on the low side as far as what I've seen with other EVs. So, you know, just that means that basically what I'm going to be getting is, you know, even though this vehicle is rated at, you know, 256 miles of range, realistically, I'm going to be getting much less than that here, at least again in the winter with these kind of conditions here. So just keep that in mind that even though you have the heat pump and stuff, I still don't think you're going to be getting actually 256 miles, at least the way I was driving, which by the way, wasn't, I wasn't hammering on this thing all the time. Most of the time I was just running errands, you know, with uh, my young daughter and my wife and so I wasn't ripping around and so you know it's just a little disappointing I think with the efficiency but anyway the last thing to mention here is the pricing of the Ionic 5 so these start around $41,000 for the base rear wheel drive one with a really underpowered motor like it's 168 horsepower and then this one as tested is basically a fully loaded limited with the all-wheel drive and this one comes out to just under $56,000 so depending on the features you want, it's it kind of has an interesting niche for itself. Because for example, this is like really the only electric vehicle that's not in the luxury segment really that gives you cooled seats. Also having the uh, sunshade over the glass roof is something that only the Volkswagen ID4 can match. And um, you know, so you have some of those kind of unique features here that, you know, might really win you over to this vehicle. But as far as the pricing goes, it is, for example, about $5,000 more expensive than a comparable Volkswagen ID4 with all wheel drive. Now that vehicle will be a little bit slower, does a little bit uh, less range. Those are, I think, 240 miles of range currently is what they're rated at. And uh, they get a few less features. The interior is also not as nice. I'm not a huge fan of the ID4, honestly, but you know, so if you do want to save some money, it's just worth noting ID4 is several thousand dollars cheaper. And the Mach E, I really view as the best EV currently in this segment because it gives you some things that Tesla doesn't, like actual gauges, like smartphone integration, and things like that. Um, and so, as far as comparing the pricing of this to a Mach E, it depends on how much range you want. So, the Mach E has uh, two different all wheel drive versions. The Ionic 5 here kind of splits the difference between those two. So, with this, this, you know you have 256 miles of range now the Mach-E you can either get a 225 mile range or a 277 mile range version so there really is no 100% direct Mach-E trim that competes with this but I think it's just worth noting that as far as um, trim levels for the Mach-E there's the premium trim which gives you basically all the stuff this limited trim gives you aside from having again that sunshade and the Mach-E does not have uh, cold seats available but if you can live without those two features you can get a premium Mach-E with all-wheel drive, if all we care about is all-wheel drive and those nice features, you can get that for 52. And then that kind of undercuts this a little bit. I think it might be 53, Ford keeps changing around the pricing, but 52 to 53, so you end up a couple of thousand dollars cheaper than the Ionic, if you're okay with living with 225 miles of range instead. Um, and then of course, if you do wanna have that extra range, you know, like I said, you get an extra 20 miles or so with that top battery pack in the Mach-E, but that will end up running you just about 59,000 dollars so then you're a few thousand over the Ionic so that's why it really is like the Ionic split the two mach -E's down the middle and you know kind of forces you to pick a side if you want to compete with the Mach-E so that really just will come down to your personal preference what you're looking for what features you're looking for how much mileage exactly you want and how much you're willing to pay for it all of course so it's all very interesting but I think that you know the Ionic really has a cool niche for itself here if you want something that you know this still feels you know like a little bit larger like I said than a normal hatchback but the fact that you know it's a little bit of a different form factor than the normal SUV type shapes you get with the Mach-E and with the ID4 you know I think this is a very unique offering I still think though having the frunk in the Mach-E gives you a lot of extra usable cargo space you don't get here in this I like that you know the Mach-E kind of does come in a little bit cheaper depending on the features the screen and the technology is a little more um, impressive I think in the Mach-E having the uh, the actual sensors there just gave me a little glitch so little amendment there it did have a little bit of a glitch there on the uh, proximity sensors but anyway getting back to the Mach-E here you know I think that 
side that has wireless smartphone integration, which you don't have here with this, because again, you have to do the weird plug-in thing, which I talked about in the interior review. There's just a few little things. They were very close in the Ionic 5, but I still think I personally prefer the Maki, -E, and I think the Maki -E, for most people probably is a little bit better. And it's nice that you can, again, have a higher range version there for those who are okay spending a few thousand dollars more. You know, it gets you a little bit closer to that 300 mile range than this, you know, doing right around 250. So, a very good first effort here from Hyundai. I'm sure there will also be improvements to these over the years and stuff. So, you know, maybe it'll get a little bit closer to competing as far as range and stuff goes down the road to maybe kind of be a better value, I'd say. Because right now, the limited trim isn't, I think, the best value out there. I think Volkswagen still has that nailed as far as electric cars go. But anyway, that's all of my thoughts here on the Ionic 5. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Huge thanks to Hyundai for providing me here with the Ionic 5 to review for you guys today. Yeah, thank you guys very much for watching. I'll see you on the next one. Take care.